Mm. Good afternoon. Today we have a very special speaker. So for this reason, also the time of our seminar was was <clears throat> delayed until four o'clock uh, p.m. Uh, the speaker is Bianca Dietrich. Let me introduce Bianca in few few words. So Bianca did her PhD in uh, Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics. Uh, and her supervisor was Thomas Timan, who is very well known in Warsaw. And when Thomas moved, when her supervisor moved to a different institution, to, then uh, Bianca followed him. So, so, uh, oh, I see. But uh, yes, so, so, so Bianca was also partially in in, in the Perimeter Institute. Next, she was a postdoctoral fellow in the Perimeter Institute. Then she was a uh, Maria Curie Fellow in Utrecht, and she was she had prestigious uh, prestigious uh, grant uh, to be uh, Max Max to be the leader group Max Planck Research Group leader at Albert Einstein Institute in Potsdam, and since 2012, uh, Bianca is a faculty member in the Perimeter Institute. So thank you for having time for us and, and visiting our seminar. Uh, the title of the talk today is Progress and Challenges for the Lorentzian Quantum Gravity Path Integral. Bianca. Uh, thank you, Jurek, for this nice introduction and thanks for inviting me to, to speak uh, in, in Warsaw. Um, so I want to present some thoughts and ideas of how to deal with the Lorentzian path integral. Um, so, well, here is the Lorentzian path integral. Um, so as you can see, it has an I in the exponent, making the integrand very uh, oscillatory. And so one main and I guess the biggest challenge then is how to compute the Lorentzian path integral. Um, because you have convergence issues, even, even for one dimensional integrals, not to speak of, of the past integral. Um, and uh, as you might know, Monte Carlo simulations are used a lot in physics, but in fact, they are not usable for such uh, oscillatory um, integrals. So that's the one uh, main problem, how to compute and evaluate the Lorentzian path integral. Uh, the second problem is how to define the Lorentzian path integral here in particular in quantum gravity. And the question there is what configuration should we integrate over? Um, in particular, if you go to uh, Lorentzian space times, there's an additional structure which is causality uh, and light cones. So the question arises, should we impose any conditions in the path integral? Should we allow for topology change in, in time to occur or not? Um, and uh, how to interpret such configurations? In the end, I will present uh, some indication that actually A, the question of how to compute the Lorentzian path integral can inform B, uh, which is kind of a bit surprising. Okay, so why do I emphasize the uh, Lorentzian path integral? Uh, in fact, a big chunk of work, um, we could say most work has been done in the context uh, of Euclidean quantum gravity and quantum gravity so far. Um, and the reason is that it's so hard to compute the Lorentzian path integral. So one wants to compute this integral with an oscillatory phase, but it's basically practically impossible so, well, uh, so far. Um, and uh, however, from um, other systems, in particular quantum field theory, it, uh, well, one technique which is extremely useful is Monte Carlo sampling. But uh, Monte Carlo sampling base is based on probabilities. And so these will work only for positive probability measures. Um, and so what to get 
to, do, to, to such positive measures, what you usually do in quantum field theory is to so-called Wick rotate. So you analytically continue your time parameter to an imaginary time. And if you do that in your action, then your um, I times the action will change into the, into the so-called Euclidean action with the minus sign. And typically in many cases, as we will see with the exception of gravity, this Euclidean action is bounded from below. So this gives you a well-defined bounded uh, probability measure. And so that has been used with huge success in lattice QCD and in other uh, condensed matter systems, for instance, to, uh, evaluate, to find phase diagrams and so on. In particular, it has been kind of the only method in a non-perturbative context to evaluate uh, pass integrals. Oh. For gravity, we face, however, the, a number of challenges. In particular, there are two big ones. One is that this weak rotation is ill-defined. Um, and so, uh, in particular, the space of Euclidean matrix is very different from the space of Lorentzian matrix. And the second is the so-called conformal factor problem, which is that the Euclidean action is in fact not bounded from below and also not bounded from above, but you have kinetic terms of both signs appearing. And so, well, it kind of, in my impression, it's these, it's these two problems which killed almost all Euclidean quantum gravity approaches. Um, and so there used to be Euclidean regic calculus, dynamical triangulations uh, and uh, lattice gauge formulations of gravity. And typically what they ended up with is the problem of this conformal factor problem. And so the problem is if, if it's unbounded from below and you do these Monte Carlo sam sampling methods, what will happen is that you typically fall into the configurations which maximize the conformal factor. And so you get very uh, wild configurations. So let me just a bit review uh, Regi calculus first in the Euclidean version, and then show you more in detail what, what this conformal factor problem is and how it kind of ended up um, in, in, as a problem in simulations. So Regi calculus is just one way, it's a particular nice way to discretize um, general relativity and basically has been used as a kind of regulator for the pass integral. So your geometry is represented uh, on by choosing a triangulation. Um, this triangulation is piecewise flat. So you allow cur curvature only at co-dimension two objects. And as variables, you have the lengths associated to the edges. Um, and there's a, a, the Regi action, which is kind of a very elegant discretization of the Einstein-Hilbert action. And it's based on a so-called deficit angle, which in QD is, is a very simple context, con well, concept. Um, if you have a bunch of triangles glued around the vertex, then the deficit angle is just the difference two to pi from the sum of the angles around this vertex. And this can be generalized to higher dimensions, to 3D and 4D, um, to, for instance, define this for 3D. You consider the tetrahedra glued around an edge, and you project all these tetrahedra to the, orthogonal, to the plane orthogonal to this edge, and then you are back in this 2D situation. So this edge, is then where curvature is concentrated and is often called a hinge. And in 4D, it's actually the triangles which are called hinges. hinges. That's where curvature is concentrated, but then in the end, these are always these two-dimensional picture of, of uh, deficit angles. So the um, Einstein-Hilbert action in the end is just given by um, all these deficit angles. And what you multiply it is with is volume of the hinge, so the length, length in 3D and the area of the triangle in, in 4D. 
And that gives you basically the same as integrating, or in the, in the continuum limit, it gives you the same as integrating over the Ricci scalar times the uh, square root of the determinant of the matrix. Um, so how does the conformal factor problem show up in Regi calculus? So length is a variable. And um, if you imagine like a 2D triangulation, I have drawn it kind of quite flat with except, exception of these uh, so-called spikes. So a spike is a configuration where you have a vertex and all the lengths of the edges attached to this vertex are very, very long. And you can have these long edges, but nevertheless, kind of the, circumfer the circumference um, of this region could be very small. Um, so it's a kind of a slightly unintuitive effect. So the volume could be actually kind of constant, but the length here is going to infinity. And these configurations tend to maximize the conformal factor. Um, so if you well, one can compute, for instance, the Regi action, so a clean Regi action with a minus sign. So here you see it's this is a certain symmetry reduced configurations where there's one parameter which kind of multiplies all edge lengths. And uh, there's a kind of small region which would be kind of classically interesting. But then there's an unbounded direction where these edge lengths can go to infinity and where this action grows linearly. So if you would do Monte Carlo simulations, the system would tend to go into this direction of uh, unbounded and, and huge um, length parameter. So your path integral would be dominated by spiky contributions. And so there was, well, uh, largely an agreement. I say that because there's always like one or two people which, which keep doing uh, things. But uh, most people agreed that Euclidean and Regi calculus does not lead to a suitable continuum limit. And one reason are spike configuration. So one idea was to define a measure over discrete geometries that could suppress such configurations. And um, <clears throat> that led to the so-called Euclidean dynamical triangulations. So here, the, the idea is more or less to replace the length variables as parameters of your geometry by the triangulation itself. So you sum only over triangulations now, which, which have where all edges have a fixed edge length, but you allow different triangulations. And so that started in the 80s. And so in the 90s, uh, uh, with Jan Ambjorn and Yuri Kukiewicz, first 4D simulations have been done. And so also it does avoid these um, spike configurations. Nevertheless, it did not lead to a suitable continuum limit. So here you see, see the two typical phases which you get uh, for Euclidean dynamical triangulations. So on the one hand, that's a so-called weakly coupled phase. Um, you get these very fractal looking configurations. Um, so these are kind of configurations which have many, 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 many simplices. And uh, you see here branching off of what, what people call baby universes. So each little um, edge here is kind of many simplices, which however grow in an almost linear structure. So that's a typical 4D triangulation in this phase. And there's a measure for dimension, the so-called house depth dimension, which is around two in this phase. And well, you could see that you could say that this branching of baby universes that's very similar to spikes. And so here it's again the configurations where uh, the conformal factor kind of dominates. On the other hand, you have so-called crumpled phase. That's where each vertex in the triangulation is almost connected to each other vertex, and you have an infinite host of dimension. 
Um, and so well, a further issue is actually that you don't have a second order phase transition. Uh, you need usually a second order phase transition to see an interesting continuum limit, but only a first order phase transition. So this, these lessons from Euclidean uh, dynamical triangulations um, have been taken as input to define so-called causal dynamical triangulations. And here, a key input is actually to say, well, these, these uh, configurations, which we have seen before, these would be absolutely forbidden if we demand that these triangulations should have something like a Lorentzian structure, and in particular, a regular Lorentzian structure. So if we demand a regular um, light cone structure, this will suppress this production of baby universes. Um, and then the idea is kind of to define a measure or uh, kind of the space of configurations, which you then do uh, your Monte Carlo simulations over, where you can actually define a regular uh, Lorentzian structure or a regular light cone structure. So I will later show in particular cases where you have an irregular light cone structure. It's actually, it's already on this, on this slide. Um, so usually you might have seen that many times and usually what in practice is used is to demand a, a regular slicing for these triangulations. But there's a more general versions which more directly works with demanding um, regularity for the light cones. And so here you see an example, we have a general 2D triangulations um, where you know, you, you use uh, Lorentzian building blocks. So the, you have various Lorentzian triangles and the blue edges here are space-like with a fixed length and the time-like edges are time-like, well, the red edges are time-like also with a fixed length. But even within these restrictions, you can easily come up with configurations where you have basically singularities in your causal structure or you could say uh, in your light cone structure. So here you see a configurations where if you draw your uh, light cones, these are the green dashed um, lines. Here you have a configurations where you have three light cones. Uh, so six light rays animating. So this gives you three light cones. And so this would be a slightly irregular well, it would be an irregular, irregular configuration, which uh, with a singular point here at the middle, here you have two light cones, so R and Minkowski space. And how can you imagine these configurations? In 2D, they typically describe topology change. So here you see a trouser configuration. And if you have such a trouser configuration, you have actually four light cones. You have two futures and two past light cones. So this was uh, well. It's it's a was a very nice idea, um, and it was very successful because the results you got from the simulations were very encouraging. Um, in particular, the main results is that there is now a phase where uh, you, you have something emerging which looks smooth at at very large scales, very large scales compared to Planck scale. And that this geometry or this volume profile of, of, these, conf of these average configurations actually gives you a digital geometry. If you then zoom in, you reduce from uh, your dimensional measure, which is a so-called spectral dimension from four to around two. And there are strong indications of second order phase transition. Well, there's a number of questions uh, still for this approach in particular, is it really GR? Can you, for instance, kind of show that, that this leads to gravitons and uh, gravitational interaction? Uh, um, you know, this more generalized version, which does not have this preferred slicing, simulations have been done in 3D, but not in 4D. Um, but the result is a, one other issue is that the simulations are still done in the Monte Carlo simulation. So you still rely on a big rotation, 
which you can do kind of from Lorentzian to Euclidean, but it's not very clear how to interpret the results and back um, in, in Lorentzian terms. Um, another question is, okay, so all these results have been obtained indeed based on this idea of requiring a regular Lorentzian structure. So is it really necessary to suppress these configurations by hand? Um, another approach which to quantum gravity, which takes causal structure as a key input is causal sets. And for instance, causal sets does not impose such conditions. Now there are much fewer results available for causal sets. So we can't say that um, this has been successful so far. Um, and also causal sets uses, if it does simulation, it uses so far Monte Carlo simulations. Okay. And in the end, I will present the mechanism that suppresses such irregular configurations automatically without uh, allowing them, uh, without disallowing them by hand. But this mechanism really uses so lo the Lorentzian structure and the calculation is the Lorentzian domain. And let me just uh, go on and therefore explain this Lorentzian Ratchet calculus and Lorentzian angles, which we need to understand to understand the issues. Uh, are there any questions so far? Uh, okay. So for Lorentzian Ratchet calculus, well, you know, the, the concepts I'm now describing seem to be quite simple, but there will be important end uh, uh, po point to the end. Um, you, you can, well, you, for, to define this, you have to define what is a Lorentzian deficit angle and what is a Lorentzian angle. Um, and so in particular, these Lorentzian angles uh, show up. If the hinge you are considering is space-like, because you project onto the plane orthogonal to the cinch. So the plane would be itself uh, time-like or have Minkowski signature, and then you have a Lorentzian angle. And so an angle in Euclidean space, as we know, is basically a measure of distance um, on, the, on the Euclidean ball, or in, if you're in 2D, on the Euclidean circle, and you have just one circle. Um, but if you are in Minkowski space, what you have is four different branches of uh, your uh, hyperbolic system here. And so you need to kind of find a way to express that two points are on different branches here. Um, and one way to do it is to introduce the well, imaginary terms in the end. Uh, that's not done completely by hand, but it's actually suggested if you take the Euclidean, uh, Euclidean definitions for, for the angles and apply a Vic rotation. And we will see that also later. So in particular, Euclidean angles, uh, that's one particular case where uh, Raphael Sokin has, has originally defined them uh, or discussed a Lorentzian version of Ratchet Calculus in 1974. Um, but then also revisited it in 2019. Um, and in fact, there has been, again, well, there has been more discussions about uh, these, these things related to this complexification of, of variables uh, in the question of kind of what kind of complex subtle points one should, for instance, allow in your pass integral. So that relates also to this question how to define the Lorentzian pass integral in the end. In any case, so the main idea in the end you, you end up here is to um, differentiate, differentiate between the cases where you have uh, the kind of one vector in one sector and the other vector in another sector by introducing these imaginary terms. And so from this analytical continuation, you get these two choices because you can analytically continue either to the plus i direction or the minus i direction. Um, and then you get this choice that if you cross a, a light ray, 
you have to take it to add basically either an IPi, IPi half or a minus IPi half. And so putting all this together, you can in principle write down these angles for all these different cases and um, have however always two versions of, of these angles. And in the end, two versions of the deficit angle But then it happens that these two different versions give you exactly the same result, usually, and differ only on configurations violating uh, something which I will call hinge like cone regularity. And on these, on these configurations where uh, these are not the same, the difference is indeed just given by this imaginary term. So that means that your action has imaginary terms, even classically. And these imaginary terms, if you imagine them in the path integral, so exponential i action, will then either enhance or suppress these configurations in the path integral. Um, and so let me just describe, show you cases where you have a violation of hinge like -hinge irregularity. So um, if you have a Lorentzian triangle, uh, it also satisfies well, a kind of triangle inequality. Um, the triangle inequality is in some sense just the opposite of the Euclidean triangle inequality. So with lengths A and B, uh, your third edge C needs to be larger than the sum of, uh, of A and B. And even if you just use these space-like edges, you can easily construct, again, configurations which are irregular. So here you have a regular case that at the inner vertex, you have two light cones. Here you have a case where you have four light cones. Again, you can just imagine that to be a, a trouser configuration. And here you have a case where you have zero light cones. So that would be like a cup um, in 2D. And so the hinge, your light cone regular at the hinge, well, if you have exactly two light cones, so that is four light rays. Um, and I say hinge because you are here considering always a projection um, to a two dimensional plane. So you co or, or always consider the co dimension two building blocks here. Um, so if you have more than two light cones, we will call these configurations trouser configurations. And that I have discussed that you, in that case, have two different definitions of your deficit angle, leading to two different definitions of your ratchet action. And depending on the choice, the plus choice suppresses trousers, and the minus choice enhances trousers. Um, but then for the kind of opposite case of having less than two light cones, you have exactly the, the opposite effect. So the plus choice enhances so-called um, Yarmulks and uh, the minus choice suppresses Yarmulks. So that is kind of one main point which Rafael Sokin discusses in his 2019 article, article. And so it seems that we have to make a choice which configurations are enhanced and which are suppressed. Um, and there's a paper by Sokin and Loku, which is actually not about Regic Calculus, but which is uh, in 2D continuum. And they argue that trousers should be suppressed and Yarmulks are enhanced. And this mostly comes from considering a, a field, a, a scalar field on top of the space time and considering like the cases, when is the scalar, the scalar field stable? And this condition was recently kind of generalized um, and, and commented on what kind of singularities we should also allow in the, in the continuum. So also I speak about Recce calculus, these considerations very nicely show up also in the in the continuum and you had uh, articles by, by Witten and so on. 
Okay, so whatever versions you choose here, there's always one class of singularities which is enhanced. And we at some point did just some tests and found that by using these, these enhanced, enhancing actions or uh, having these uh, configurations which enhances enhance the probabilities is dangerous. Uh, so all these options seem to be quite dangerous. So it gives you unphysical results if you compute the probabilities associated with that. So indeed, you could say, well, then let's forbid such like cone irregulars, irregular, irregularities explicitly, as in causal dynamical triangulations. So in particular, you would not allow any topology change. Or is another alternative would be that, is there some way, some mechanism that um, suppresses such high hinge causality violations? And we will indeed learn that there might be such a, such a mechanism. And this mechanism has a lot to do with analytical continuation. So I am going to kind of, uh, we are going now to consider basically the Ratchet action in the complex plane. Um, in fact, I will simplify such that we can consider it in the complex plane. Uh, in general, of course, uh, Ratchet action is a function of, of many variables. And so you would have to consider it um, on the space of, of many complexified variables. But uh, well, that is sometimes a bit hard to imagine. Uh, and to start with, we would have to kind of consider the, the angle between two vectors uh, as a generalized to generalize it uh, on complexified variables. Now, one way to do that is to kind of use some, some version of equation. Um, so here is an example where I take uh, two, two D vectors. So A, A and B, and I define basically a generalized Wick quotation for the inner product by introducing this phase exponential i phi into the zero components of these uh, vectors. Um, so phi would be the Wick quotation angle for phi equal to zero, you get Euclidean inner product for phi equal to pi or minus pi, you get uh, the Lorentzian inner product with a minus sign here. And then you can define uh, kind of a general formula for an ingle as the function of phi uh, by this formula, which with caveats, if you actually uh, specify the values of, of, of the log and the square roots on branch cuts, it reproduces the Euclidean and Lorentzian ingles. So here um, I plotted basically this, this angle, the function as a function of um, phi. So you see you have um, a branch cut at phi equal to zero and phi equal to pi. So you have two uh, regions where this function is analytical and the green and blue are just two different cases. So you can analytically continue either this region or this region. And so here's a case that you analytically continue the, um, this region. If you analytically continue this region, what you will find is just the same thing, just with a global minus sign. So you, in the end, it will, it will lead to the same result. Uh, in any case, if you analytically continue, you will find something. So basically now you go from minus two pi to two pi. So you have a double, uh, yeah, you have a, a Riemann sheet now going from uh, which doubles the range here. Um, and in fact, you get now uh, Euclidean, the Euclidean value at phi equal to zero and phi equal to two pi. 
and you get the Lorentzian value at phi equal to minus pi and pi. So this looks like completely analytical as a function of phi, but in fact, I've taken here two vectors which are either space-like or time-like. If you change your vector slowly to be null, then you still get branch points. And if you circle around them, you find the uh, singularities of this type of, of logarithm square root of z. So in the end, you get actually um, well, an infinite Riemann surface kind of. So this is done for, for one dihedral angle. You can all sum that up in the deficit angle and then uh, define the complex side reaction um, as a function for complex complexified squared edge lengths. And you will always have branch, well, you will have branch points for configurations with uh, null edges. Um, I mean, not necessarily, but that's one condition to get a branch point. And in particular, you will have branch cuts for configurations which violate hinge regularity. But using this complexification, you find a unified version for your Lorentzian action. You get basically, you cover all possible sign well, global sign choices. Um, and you cover the Lorentzian and Euclidean case. So um, here I've drawn the picture where I, we consider basically a, simplica a simplified case of considering um, the complex complexification of only one variable, um, which has a function, by which, which this variable you can interpret as lapse function. And so that works very similar to the big rotation. Um, and so if you are in the complex plane for this lapse function for this one variable, uh, what you find is that for phi equal to zero, you get a minus or a clean in action. So that would be like the result of the usual big rotation. If you then go to phi equal to pi, you do find the Lorentzian action with an I. Um, so you find these two versions which agree as long as you are a uh, hinge regular. But if you go to this hinge irregular um, configurations, these two versions differ by these imaginary terms. You go further, you find then plus or so Euclidean action. And um, if you go around to phi equal to minus pi, you find again that these two cases differ by a global minus sign, well, except for this imaginary part on, uh, on the branch cut. So that's the picture uh, you, you will get for this simplified case where you have only one complex variable and that's what I can draw. If you have many more complex variables, of course, the pictures gets to be much more complicated. Um, later on, I will show pictures which look like that. So here, um, the complex plane is just uh, represented in the usual kind of polar representation. Here, this angle phi is uh, the x-axis at the bottom. And so uh, here, at this is the absolute value of the variable. Um, so this is actually just a point um, and the absolute value of the laps goes in this direction. And then if I have a Euclidean line, that would be phi equal to zero, which, so these would be the Euclidean configurations and this would be the Lorentzian configurations. Okay. So any questions to that? Because uh, I will go on. Uh, and change, apply apply these things to Lorentzian quantum cosmology. And there's one, the simplest case of Lorentzian quantum cosmology. 
um, where you have just um, the scale factor and and the, the labs to consider and no matter. And so in that case, what you will find as a classical solution is a desitter space. And so Lorentzian desitter space, uh, well, at least in, in two dimensions looks uh, like that. So you um, have uh, this, this equator, which has a minimal, so that would be a minimal spatial slice with a minimal volume. And in both directions, in both time-like directions, you grow in an exponential fashion the volumina of your slices. So that would be classical desitter. And as you surely know, there is basically this idea of the no-boundary wave function of the universe. And that comes indeed from um, the idea that uh, you could either tunnel or analytically continue um, a portion of your geometry. And so uh, at the equator, what is supposed to happen is that an Euclidean desitter sphere gets glued to the Lorentzian desitter half. And this Euclidean desitter sphere, so there is a point at the pole where you have zero scale factor. And so this then gives you a width or a probability to go from a zero scale factor. So in some sense, the Big Bang or the beginning of the universe to a finite scale factor, even in this kind of Lorentzian geometry regime. And so originally that was discussed within Euclidean uh, quantum gravity. More recently, that has been also discussed within uh, Lorentz, the Lorentzian path integral for mini, mini superspace um, in the continuum. In all these considerations, what you can do is after a clever variable transformation, you can integrate out um, the scale factor uh, for, from the path integral. So you are only left with the uh, integration over the laps. So in principle, you would have to integrate over the laps at each, at each time. But well, the laps is kind of a gauge function. So uh, you can gauge fix. And then you're just left with a global laps parameter. So in the end, you reduce your path integral to just a one-dimensional integral over, over this global laps parameter. Um, and if you, if you look at the saddle point equations for this global laps parameter, um, you, you have different cases depending on your initial and final value of your scale factor. And so if like these values are smaller than actually this minimal equator, uh, in the Lorentzian case, so you are kind of in a classically forbidden region, then the settle point will be uh, poorly imaginary. So you will have an Euclidean value basically for this lapse. If one is smaller and the other is bigger, you find a complex solution. And if both are larger than the, uh, this value for the equator, you find a real solution. So that is the classical loud regions. Um, so if you would do these uh, considerations within so-called Euclidean quantum cosmology, then typically, you know, if you read the old literature, there's kind of a long discussion of how to choose the contour and uh, it's not done according to some mathematical formalism rather from, it's informed by physics. It's basically, you want to have reasonable results. And according to that, this contour is chosen. In any case, these original discussions then said, what, what you should get is a probability, um, which in the end leads to an enhancement with this factor, which is exponential minus the Euclidean action. But minus the Euclidean action turns out to be actually a positive thing. 
So what you get here is three divided by the cosmological constant. And so that's the case where in fact the conformal factor dominates um, and gives you even an enhanced probability distribution. And there's a Vilenkin version based on tunneling and the more recent work by Turok and Feldbrücke and uh, Lenas using Picard Lefschitz, which I will also discuss, discuss. And there you rather find the suppression uh, with exactly the opposite sign. Okay, and we aim to do that kind of non-perturbatively. So actually there is an issue in this continuum discussion with integrating out the scale factor. That's actually not done. I, I told you you can do that um, because it's quadratic, but in fact it's not done properly because uh, in the continuum calculation just assumes, assumes a Gaussian and uses a Gaussian formula to do the path integral. Um, but in fact, you are only supposed to integrate over positive scale factors. Um, to also just, well, to be able to also consider just a one dimensional path integral, we will consider one time step in a discretized universe. And so in Reche to do that, Kind of conveniently, we slightly generalize the Ratchet setup and allow uh, so-called frustra as building blocks. So you can consider that as tetrahedra, which can grow or shrink in time. So if you're interested in the zeta, they will grow in time. And we glue these frustra um, or the tetrahedra to regular um, three balls. Um, and for instance, you can consider a, a 600 cell. So these are regular, these are the only regular uh, polyhedra, uh, which kind of are glued from simply says from tetrahedra um, in three dimensions. There's a five cell, that's the usual simplex, um, a 16 cell, and a 600 cell. And the 600 cell gives you the best approximation. There's still an issue um, because here what you what we do is to keep the spatial discretization. We keep always the same number of building blocks, namely uh, in the case of the 600 cell, 600, but we describe an exponential expansion of space. And so basically the discretization gets worse and worse. And in fact, what happens is that you cannot model in, for infinite time the exponential expansion. Um, what you will see if you if you do that in a continuum time limit is that um, the growth is bounded and slows down to a linear growth here. And so for the 600 cells, it happens at kind of a later point than for the five cell. But for this regime, you find a good approximation between well, the discretization and the continuum. And so that's just a lesson to consider just the regime where this discretization gives you good correspondence with the continuum. And one reason why this bound happens are in fact hinge regularity violations. Um, so in this building block, we have three parameters, basically the size of this initial tetrahedron, the size of the um, final tetrahedron and the height of this frustrum. However, if basically um, this height gets smaller and smaller, and depending on the difference between, this, between these two tetra tetrahedra, at some point, what will happen is that these time-like edges, and particularly the time-like faces and tetrahedra, change from being time-like to space-like. And um, that happens if, in some sense, the expansion gets too fast as compared to the, to the height. Um, and in that case, you get actually a violation of hinge regularities. So your light cone change, the number of your light cones in this projected plane changes from two to something which, if I remember correctly, is less than two. So we have this hinge regularity violations in four dimensions, different from two dimensions. There's however 
not really an associated change in topology. So all the space like hypersurfaces are still three spheres, but it's interesting that in this very simple setup, which just is supposed to describe a cosmology, um, we nevertheless already have to deal with these uh, light cone irregular configurations. Um, okay, and in this picture, what we will see is that along the Lorentzian uh, line, which we want to in principle integrate over, we will have a branch cut. And so this branch cut happens at quite small values of the lapse function. Um, okay. So, This, this basically, these irregularities leave, lead to these branch cuts. And we would have to um, decide how to navigate these branch cuts. But then we also want to do this integral over the lapse, which in principle goes to infinity. So uh, the, the lapse can, can go to, to infinity. And we would have to integrate this highly oscillating phase. Uh, and if you do try to just do it straightforwardly numerically, it won't converge. So already for this very simple case, you get a, you get a problem. Um, and so what I'm going to discuss now is basically the, the deformation of the path integral, and it's informed by Picard left shift theory. Um, Later, I will tell you a technique which allows you to, to evaluate these integrals without using this picard uh, or even without using deformation of the integration contour. But for now, we will consider this deformation of the integration contour. Um, so this is based on, on the integrand being, in principle, analytically, well, modulo these branch cuts, of course. And so you can deform the integration contour. Uh, and there is a particular nice deformation or a new integration contour, which is called the left shift symbol. And in this picture is basically the green line, which defines the left shift symbol. The black line will be the uh, left shift anti symbol. And the original contour is, this, is basically the Lorentzian axis at phi equal to pi. Um, so the left shift symbol goes uh, through your settle point and is defined that from your settle point, you choose um, the direction of steepest descent for the real part of your exponent function. And so it would not continue to go along the real axis, but in that case, it would depart from the real axis. And you see here that for asymptotic large laps, it goes towards the direction of phi equal to zero. So towards the Euclidean Vic rotated version. So in some sense, it's a mathematical foundation, but we will see that it's kind of for the Vic rotation, but we will see that it kind of also tells you how to Vic rotate more precisely uh, than just choosing a fixed direction. So that happens for a uh, larger n. You see that for a smaller n, if you go the other direction, you actually enter like values which are larger than pi. So you will rotate in the other direction. And then later I will tell you what happens. So here you go actually through the branch cut. Um, okay. So then it's something which you can prove in two lines along this line of deepest descent for the real part of the exponent function. Uh, what happens for the imaginary part is that this imaginary part happens to be constant along this line. And so your integrand along the green line becomes actually non-oscillating. And since this is the steepest descent for the real part of the exponent function, it becomes de decaying, fastly decaying, you hope. And of course, you have still to prove that if you go back to, so you can connect with an arc to the Lorentzian axis, that these parts um, of your integration contour do not contribute 
or contribute, yeah, or do not contribute. Um, so usually Picard left shifts is often discussed in the context of doing a settle point approximation. We are not doing that, in fact, because we want to see also the difference of including these irregular cases or not including these. We are really deforming a numerical integration contour along the left shift symbol. And so I, I will just try to, to cover the two cases. One is an example of the no boundary wave function. So that's where we will find an, a saddle point on the imaginary axis. And your left symbol happens to agree with the Euclidean line, but it's the Euclidean line at phi equal to tie, two pi and not at phi equal to pi. So that's actually that you rotate towards plus the Euclidean action. So it's the opposite of the standard story of Euclidean quantum gravity. And you have two choices to integrate over um, the full Lorentzian axis with the branch cut uh, or not to do that. And that means that when you do the deformation, so either you have to add an extra arc or you do not have to add an extra arc. And so the first choice is to integrate over the full Lorentzian axis, which translates to integrate over the full Euclidean axis. And we will find we, we find results which in this regime, which kind of matches well with the continuum, in fact, gives you a result which matches well the continuum. Um, in particular, the wave function is real because we just integrate over the real axis. And so the dashed line, I think, is a continuum, and the solid line is, uh, is our result. If you go for option two, that is, you define the path integral in the Lorentzian domain to not to integrate over the irregular configurations, you would have to add an extra arc here, which goes from this point at phi equal to zero um, and uh, h squared being zero to your branch point where your branch cut starts on the Lorentzian axis. And so in that case, first of all, your wave function is complex and uh, you have like where you have oscillations. Um, and it also decays slower than in the, in, in the, in the option one case. Um, so you, that corresponds less to the continuum case. Um, I should add here in case you do add, you do consider also integration over the branch branch cut, which side of the branch cut you are actually integrating over, well, is determined by your deformation of the contour, and this deformation is defined by the left shift symbol. So the left shift symbol is on a certain side of your branch cut. And it happens to always be on the side which suppresses these configuration. So you have a mechanism which basically suppresses always uh, these configurations with irregular uh, light cone structure. Um, so here is an example where you have a settle point on the Lorentzian axis. Uh, then the left shift symbol goes through, uh, well, cuts through the Lorentzian axis. Uh, a, fun, a fun fact is that it does go through the branch cut here and actually continues on a second Riemann sheet and goes back to infinity. So we don't want to kind of do this integral from laps being infinity to laps being infinite, infinity again. We rather, you know, then numerically integrate and go back to go back to zero here. But this contour again uh, finds always the side of the branch cut where uh, the real part of, of the exponent function is maximally negative. So all these uh, irregular um, configurations are maximally suppressed. And so here are some results for, uh, for the power integral. 
this first and black uh, by including the irregular configurations and in red by not including the irregular configurations, you see different values for um, the, the cosmological constant expressed in Planck's unit. Um, and well, you, you could say that the differences are relatively small um, in, in the Euclidean case, the relative differences were quite huge because, because the absolute values were also very small. And well, whether you get larger or smaller differences also depends on your value of the cosmological constant. So he, also what happens here is that now you rotate to minus Euclidean action. So that's the standard story of Euclidean, um, quantum, of Euclidean quantum gravity. Um, but you cross your Lorentzian line at the subtle point. And so again, you are on the side um, if it comes to irregular configuration, which suppress these configurations. So since the left shift symbol is defined to minimize the, these real parts, it always finds the suppressing side of the branch cuts. And that should lead to the suppression for Yarmulks and trousers and resolve this um, problem which we had if you make a global choice, which kind of Raphael Sorkin suggested, that you either um, enhance the Yarmulks or you enhance the trousers, which seems to be problematic. Um, so the summary so far, well, there's progress to evaluate the Lorentzian path integral for, for discrete gravity. So there's kind of, there has been some developments for continuum gravity and one uh, quite active group was, was the one of Neil Tuborg and so on. Um, in the case of, mi of mini superspace cosmology. So to apply to discrete uh, gravity, you have to define the complex Ratchet action. And that is actually, you know, something defined on a, on a Riemann sheet with branch cuts for uh, irregular light cone structure cases. Um, you can apply Pika left shots, and that makes it numerically feasible. It gets, of course, more complicated if you consider more variables. But we see that how you Vic rotate is determined by the dynamics and the boundary conditions. And so that could give you a mechanism to avoid the conformal factor problem. And in principle, it seems also that we can allow a regular like cone structure. In fact, if you would have to forbid it, it would be typically it's very hard to implement these kind of conditions in your path integral. So uh, there are lots of things to do, in particular, do all these things for higher dimensional integrals. Now, um, a last comment is that well, I'm, I'm coming from doing spin forms, and there we rather do not integrate, but we sum. Um, and so it's not, we cannot do an analytical deformation of the summation contour. Well, we try to use some concepts of discrete analytical um, functions, but somehow they do not work as in the continuum. However, what we can, what we have seen, what we can use is so-called acceleration operators. So these are quite old techniques, which, um, yeah, uh, probably were very well known in the in the in the some some years back, but now uh, not so well known. But in principle, um, here you see kind of a sum where I truncated to a certain value of of terms. So here it's up to 50,000 50, terms. And it's actually a sum where we compute an expectation value and it does not converge. As you see, it actually diverges and gives you this funny pattern. Um, but then you can apply a certain technique. Um, I think that's rep uh, repeated Schenck's transformations. And already after 100 terms, you get a very convergent result. Here it sees you see some fluctuations, but actually the differences are very, very small. And so that actually we can apply this to both the Lorentzian path integral, but also to spin forms. Okay, so what I wanted to say is that we should really do Lorentzian path integrals. And that's the main point. 
Um, and then the results so far seem to indeed differ from Euclidean quantum gravity. But doing Lorentzian path integrals, we have to answer these questions of what happens with uh, the Lorentzian structures and irregular structures. But it also allows us now to probe really uh, light wave fluctuations directly and like things like quantum causal structures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are several questions uh, here, and uh, maybe we start with with the uh, uh, virtual audience. So, any anybody from the Zoom listeners would like to ask a question? Piotr? Yeah. Well, I, uh, you mentioned at some stage points where uh, it looked like there are more than one light cone issuing from this point. Uh, this doesn't quite fit in a metric uh, structure, does it? So how, how should one understand this? Oh, you mean um, these light cone irregularities? Yeah, so I, it, I mean, you were just suggesting there are two light cones issuing from yeah, one yeah. point. No, this I is mean, this is indeed forbidden if you want to say I have a regular Lorentzian metric. Well, I mean, you have a, a, a metric at all, it's forbidden, right? I mean, it's just not even regular. I don't, I mean, yeah, or Lorentzian metric depending. Yeah, yeah. Um, these these things are, are discussed in two D. There's a bit of discussion for people which do um, which are interested in topology change. Uh, so these are kind of more. I mean, you can discuss it using more theory and more points. Um, so you allow isolated. Well, but I, I understand what isolated say, violations. No. So it's isolated violations where your metric is not Lorentzian. But there isn't even a metric. You have to, four light cones, as you're saying. I mean, a light cone yeah. is, has something to do with a metric. So uh, either there yeah, is so, a metric or not. And if there is a metric, okay, so, it's so just two if light you, cones. If you want, there, there is no metric at this point. OK. I think that, I mean, let me correct this. You, you still can can kind of determine the, the length in this tangent space, if you want. Um, but it's it's certainly not not the Lorentzian metric at this point but it's isolated and so in 2d you know there have been a number of papers discussing discussing this uh, i agree that that if you if you are interested and in, well you are so uh, the space of lorentzian matrix and so on you do not allow those those points because many things would be destroyed by this i mean if four light cones you could have you have a finsler metric right with with uh, uh, i don't know uh, Higher order uh, signature, but uh, but uh, not not with yeah. the Lorentzian metric. I mean, continuous yeah, no, not or not continuous, even if it's not continuous, yeah. but if it's defined, then this can yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But you know, the, the the issue is indeed if you, I mean, in the in the discrete, actually, there's even arguments. For instance, by Don Marov, that we should allow such configurations and. I know there's kind of these replica calculations which supposedly resolve information paradox. They use such configurations. Rafael Sorkin has also, well, you know, these these works which I mentioned by Rafael Sorkin and and um, Yoma Loku. They use these configurations, or they consider discuss these configurations using more theory, and there's kind of many questions to indeed make it a bit more structured and mathematically viable. Yeah, and but in quantum gravity, if you use this regularization, you know, we usually hope that this allows us to define the path integral. You naturally also have always these configurations. I mean, it's, it's you will easily produce these configurations where you have um, more than two or less than two light cones. Now I said, this time, you know, yeah, you can you can forbid them or not. Okay. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, so you very often apply the the weak transform. I mean, in the in the results which you which you reported on, the yeah, so, big transform uh, is often applied. And my understanding is that the big transform is applied 
by a analytic continuation of 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 uh, some result for Euclidean gravity, but usually those results which we have are in numerical form. So, so we somehow analytically continue numerical results, which well, which which. Yeah. No, I'm not. not I, I, I'm, I'm not doing that. Okay. Okay. Good. So, um, I I here I kind of, I use it only, you know, I, I want to introduce a, vic a complexification and I use the word Vic rotation to, to hopefully remind people that they might have seen something similar in the case of a Vic rotation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so what, well, what I'm doing is really starting from the Lorentzian integral and then use the deformation of the contour and well, actually, you know, the zeroth order is I use the deformation of the contour of the Lorentzian path integral to evaluate the path integral. The example I presented, it happens that you can a bit imagine that this works a bit similar to the to the Vic rotation, but in fact, you already learn that the standard interpretation, the standard use of the Vic rotation gives you the wrong result, for instance, in the Euclidean, in this case, where we discuss uh, tunneling in the Zitter space. So you would not get the right result there. Uh, but in general, I just do this deformation of the integration contour. Um, and then I also say, well, we, we use the definition of left shift symbol to define what is our new contour. Uh, but of course, by mathematical framework, the two integrals are in principle the same, just that numerically, I cannot just do simple the Lorentzian integration contour because it wouldn't converge. It's not absolutely convergent. If I use the acceleration technique to compute these things, I would get exactly the same result by just doing the Lorentzian integral directly. You know, if I use uh, this funny oscillation operator technique, which I didn't explain, I only, I don't need to do a deformation and then I get the same result. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. I think Boitek also has some questions. Uh, so I yeah. have a question about this uh, complex angles. Uh -huh. so, so you define uh, in case of a sphere. So you, you should speak to the, to the micro. Yes, yeah, so maybe, <laughs> do you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so you have these complex angles, but if you look for the asymptotic of spin forms, you, yeah. you don't see the complex angles there. Yeah, it's a question I asked you, so. <laughs> yeah, so, but it was a long time ago, so maybe now you know the answer. <laughs> so do you know? I, I, I met more people which are unhappy with the status. <laughs> okay. So, well, I plan to resolve that. Yeah, I, well, I hope. To, to look at 3D Lorentzian Ponzano Recce model to, to learn that, yeah. Okay, so it's not clear why or whether it's not because it's the result for spin forms usually they're for the single uh, vertex and yeah. so yeah. it's not obvious uh, what would be in the case of triangulation. Okay, so thank you. Are there are there any any more questions? Anybody would like to ask a question or make a comment? Okay, this is uh, not the case. Okay, Bianca. So thank you. Let us thank the speaker again. Thank you for listening. And yeah. Uh, okay. Well,